Well, if you remember, when we looked at Elijah, he was in a bad state last week. And we're 40 days later now, and he's still in a bad way. The word of the Lord comes to Elijah, what are you doing here? And Elijah, well, he's not in the past been much of a complainer. When told to go to a brook and to feed on the spat out remnants that ravens gave him, he didn't complain. When the brook ran dry and he was told to go and be looked after by an impoverished foreign widow, he doesn't complain. When he's asked to face King Ahab, he doesn't complain. When he's asked to take on the prophets of Baal, he doesn't complain. But what we have here, what we had in our reading, is big time whinging from Elijah. And he's complaining, he's positive in the sense that he's being totally honest with God. And that's a great thing, especially when you think Elijah had seen the awesome power of God in sending fire from heaven. You'd have thought that might have made Elijah perhaps a little bit more careful with his words. But Elijah understood that God, as well as being powerful, God is also compassionate and loving. And so Elijah tells it as he feels it. But when you look at what Elijah says and analyse it, you see the ways in which self-pity and depression can distort the way we look at life. He begins by saying, I have been very zealous. And give him his due, Elijah has been very zealous. But does he have to say it in that whiny, complaining voice? God knew that Elijah had been very zealous. Was Elijah, by stressing this, in a sense complaining that his level of commitment had not been matched by a similar response from God? And it's amazing that we do find ourselves in moods when we feel God has given us a rough deal. Life's not worked out how we planned. How could God do this when we've tried so hard? We somehow forget that the air that we breathe, the food we enjoy, the sunshine on our backs, all this comes from God. He created us. He gave to each one of us the gift of life. And for us who live in New Testament times, he's the one who gave us his son out of love for us. We're seriously into distorted self-pity world when we manage to convince ourselves that we are getting a rough deal from God. And yet it so easily happens Let me give a relatively trivial example. Just over a week ago, I was close to a meltdown with God. I had prepared meticulously for church and chips, and with an hour to spare before the service, I was there doing the final preparations in the centre. I set things up efficiently and then tested the PowerPoint, the slides that go up on the screen. For some reason, they didn't want to open up. I waited for some time and then closed the program down. I retried it, and this time it gave me one of those helpful messages. There's been a serious error, and did I want to try again? Yes, I did. Still, it didn't work. It worked with another slide presentation, but not the one I needed. I was still fairly calm, for I was in good time. I shut down the whole computer and started again. The same happened. Starting to be a little bit anxious, I rushed back to my home, to my my office computer and decided to split the service into two. I thought the problem might be the wonderful slides, wonderful pictures I downloaded for my talk. So I took them out, put them on a different slideshow, and came back, put those two new presentations onto my memory stick, and then went back over to the centre and tried them out. Neither of the two new programmes worked. Time was beginning to get a little bit pressured. I decided, well, if I can't rescue anything else, I'll at least rescue the songs. So I went back again home to my office computer, looked up where I'd previously used 
those songs in services. It took a little bit of time, beginning to feel a bit panicky. As I dashed back to the centre with that important information, it was now about one minute to go before the start. The laptop in the church centre refused to open any of my previous presentations. I had to abandon my attempt to show anything on the screen. We had no words for songs. We had no pictures for telling the story that was the key part of my talk. In the panic, I'd forgotten to get the microphones out. And also in the rush, I'd not thought of a much simpler solution, dash over to church and get some hymn books. So we sang the songs from memory, which as you can imagine was very hard for those of those, those people there who'd never sung the songs before. It's quite difficult to sing them from memory then. And I stumbled my way through the talk. My mood when I eventually got home was, to put it mildly, not good. I felt that God had let me down big time when I tried really hard. But in the cold light of day, what a crazy thing to feel. I had had some first world problems. Nobody died, nobody was injured, perhaps part from my pride. God had let me down? You must be kidding. God who has been so good to me, always patient, astonishingly forgiving and generous, who gave his only son for me. I'm sure you get the point. We're seriously into self-distorted, sorry, into distorted self-pity world when we manage to convince ourselves that we are having a rough deal from God. But Elijah goes on to say, the Israelites have rejected your covenant, Lord. Well, yes. But what about what happened at Carmel? Had they not shouted, the Lord, he is God? Had they not joined with Elijah in putting the priests of Baal to death? In his depression, Elijah sees things only as black. But there are other colours as well. He claims that the Israelites had put the prophets of the true God to death. Well, that's not the case. It was Queen Jezebel who'd done that. He goes on to say, I'm the only one left. Well, later on, God corrects him by saying, in fact, 7,000 have not worshipped Baal. Now... Elijah could be forgiven for not knowing that, but he did know that there were at least a hundred faithful prophets because Obadiah had told him so. So come on, Elijah, you weren't the only one. But in the depth of depression, we do not think very clearly. It's easy to think that we're completely on our own. The way some ministers of churches talk, you get the impression that everyone's leaving the church and no one is willing to do anything. Sometimes we can only see what we've been doing to sort things out and somehow we forget everyone else's contribution. Everyone was not against Elijah. I mentioned last week I wanted to say a little bit more about the dangers of loneliness because Elijah does seem to be a classic example of someone who hadn't realised the importance of friendships and the dangers of going it alone. We saw last week how he deliberately left his servant behind to go alone on this journey. And part of the help that God gives to Elijah is to tell him to have a successor. He gives him Elisha to be with him. And we heard in our reading of how Elisha followed Elijah. And he was with him constantly from then on. And they became very close. I read a book about friendship. It had a good title. Everybody's normal till you get to know them. (laughs) The author pointed out how at the beginning, before the fall, when everything was just as God intended... We're still told of one thing that was not good. It was not good for the man to be alone. Now, I've not really thought about that. I've preached about how Jesus is our best friend and how we can have the closest relationship with him. But it's not enough. The Bible says it is not good for the man to be alone. 
We were meant to have human friendship and companionship. Elijah needed friends. He tried to carry a gargantuan load upon his shoulders single-handedly and eventually he collapsed. And there are so many Christians today who are dying inside because of terminal loneliness. And many of them are church leaders who, as Jeff Lucas says, smile brightly in public, talk eloquently about love and the blessing of fellowship, and who break down and weep like babies when asked who their friends are. Jesus had friends. Among his followers, he's had special relationships with just 12. And amongst those 12, there was a small group of three, Peter, James and John. He would take them with him on special occasions, such as the transfiguration on the mountaintop, certain healings in prayer at Gethsemane. If Jesus had friends, isn't it supreme folly to think that we can do without them? And yet, in many ways, the world of church is not very good at friendship. There's the old quip about the church being good at keeping minutes and wasting hours, and how church life is full of meetings where no one ever meets. We're sometimes so business, agenda-focused. Often we consider evangelism, Bible study, prayer, well, they're, they're really spiritual. But laughter, sharing, friendship, not really that key. This is where home groups should come into their own. But sometimes they're so study-focused that people can be quietly screaming inside and the other members of the group never even realise. Saying that we are a, f a fellowship, a family, means more than exchanging a quick handshake in the middle of the service or singing Bind Us Together 9,000 times. We need to make space in our lives to engage in events that allow friendships to blossom. Friendships take time, but we were meant to have friends. But to return to Elijah, so after pouring out his tale of woe, God tells Elijah to get ready, for the presence of the Lord is about to pass by. And we get this amazing account of the mighty wind, the tremendous earthquake, and then a fire. But we're told on each occasion, the Lord was not in the wind or the earthquake or in the fire. What is going on? I'm, I'm really not sure, having read the commentators. The wind, fire and earthquake were traditional signs of God's presence. So, for instance, when God had appeared to Moses and the people of Israel on this very same mountain, there had been fire and earthquake. So what Elijah saw was very much how people expected God to appear. And after all, hadn't God sent fire from heaven at Mount Carmel? But perhaps what this incident is about is re-educating Elijah. God was showing him, yes, I can do powerful, amazing signs, but I can also be in the gentle whisper. Again, I find this challenging. Part of me is praying that God will do something really dramatic to bring about revival, not only in this church, but throughout our country. Surely we need to do God to do something that's incredible. But could it be through the gentle whisper that God will reveal himself? I read a book called The Tipping Point, which is a book looking at how certain products and ideas become almost overnight phenomena, such as eBay and the iPod. The author, Malcolm Gladwell's research, showed how often it was word of mouth, in a sense, small-scale happenings that were a key factor. Now, who remembers Hush Puppies? Hush Puppies, a maker's shoe, were going nowhere in the early 1990s. They were associated with blandness and middle age. Not my words, but the words of the book. 
selling only 30,000 pairs a year and going nowhere fast. Things looked bleak and then suddenly in 1995 they sold 430,000 pairs of shoes. The bizarre explanation was that some kids in the hip part of New York had decided that hush puppies were cool. Obviously one or two trendsetters had started wearing them and out of this grew an incredible upturn in hush puppy fortunes. Now you didn't come for a sermon on hush puppies but we miss out if we think that for something major to happen in the spiritual life of our nation there's got to be some incredible earth-shattering event. It may be that in the gentle whisper God will be at work. Real change may be a lot nearer, a lot closer than we think. And we could be a part of it. Another reason why God reveals himself to Elijah in the gentle whisper may have been that in the midst of depression, we need to be still and quiet in God's presence to shut down all the other noises that would drown out the soft whispers of God's love. Once again, though, as you read through the story, Elijah seems totally underwhelmed. God asks him once more, what are you doing here? And Elijah comes out word for word with exactly the same complaint as before. It's an important reminder to us that You don't snap out of depression quickly or easily. Instead, the same dark thoughts circle round in our heads like a record stuck in a groove. It shows what a good listener God is that he allows Elijah to keep telling him the same old complaints. We do not tire God out. His patience is unlimited. That's what 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 16 tells us. God's patience is unlimited. And then God speaks to Elijah, showing him that there is work, a new role that he, Elijah, can do. That there will be a vindication for Elijah. There will be judgment for Israel, Ahab and Jezebel. There's also a word of correction for Elijah. Things are not as bad as he thinks there are. There are 7,000 who are still faithful. And best of all, there's assistance for Elijah. He's no longer to be a lone ranger. Instead, he's going to have Elisha by his side. This incident in the Bible inspired one of our greatest hymns. We're about to sing it, but before we do, I'd like to read some of the words of the hymn. Drop thy still dews of quietness till all our strivings cease. Take from our souls the strain and stress and let our ordered lives confess the beauty of thy peace. Breathe through the heats of our desire, thy coolness and thy balm. Let sense be dumb, let flesh retire. Speak through the earthquake, wind and fire, O still, small voice of calm. Amen.